Hi, and welcome to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Today, we're going to be talking about kidney disease. And we're doing that because March is Kidney Disease Awareness Month in Canada. And the statistics are overwhelming. Currently in Ontario, the number of people with end-stage renal kidney disease has grown over 37%, from 14,800 to about 20,300 people. That is a staggering statistic. Today we're going to be speaking with uh, Whistle Radio's own Jason Rumble. Jason is a kidney transplant recipient. He's currently back on dialysis after his transplanted kidney failed and he is probably one of the most uh, well-spoken people about this issue and he's well known to everyone in the Stouffville area. Jason Rumball, good morning and welcome to Fresh Waves. Morning Brent, uh, it's uh, great to uh, speak with you and uh, have me uh, on your show. Well, I'm a part of the Fresh Waves team, but it's great to uh, be a part of this episode today. Well, your kidney that was donated by your sister has allowed you to do a lot of volunteer work and become a very prominent member of the community of Stovall, Ontario, Canada. And I can honestly say that I have benefited very much from your friendship and your vibrant life by having you as the technical producer of this show for the last 10 years. Thank you. You're very welcome. Wow, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years and... Uh, you know, it's been so great to, uh, you know, I host my own show, Block Party, on Saturday nights, a dance music show, and, and to uh, also uh, be a producer on uh, Fresh Waves and do all these great episodes. It's been just a lot of fun, and I've really learned a lot. Now, for everyone who knows you, we know your story, but for those people listening from other places or who are new to Stouffville and don't know your story, can you tell us your story from the beginning? Okay, sure. Um, so uh, when I was born, I was born with um, a condition known as uh, a spina bifida. Um, you know, some doctors over the years, as I was, uh, you know, growing up through childhood, there was some debate as to what the diagnosis was. Some said cerebral palsy, some said spina bifida, and some, uh, you know, they, they weren't too sure what the actual diagnosis is. But, uh, you know, from what I've learned uh, so far, looking back and talking to, you know, doctors more recently, uh, they come to the conclusion that I was born with uh, spina bifida, and spina bifida is um, is a birth defect, um, uh, which uh, they've known from recent studies is a, a lack of uh, folic acid in the uh, in the diet, so it can cause um, um, the, you know problems with um, uh, you know the spine being incomplete. It's like uh, when you uh, say you have a broken zipper and there's a you know hole in the in the zipper when you try to pull it pull it up. It's uh, quite similar to that. Um, uh, a lot of people born with spina bifida they're uh, they're paralyzed from the waist down. They have uh, you know they have to be in a wheelchair. They can't walk. But uh, for me, fortunately, I've been uh, you know able to you know walk and be pretty independent. But there's some things that uh, you know come with spina bifida. Um, uh, there's uh, like a, when I was born, I had uh, uh, a condition known as hydrocephalus, which was uh, fluid on the brain, and uh, you know it was quite serious. Uh, you know, without uh, any surgical intervention, I, I probably would have died. I wouldn't have made it. So, um, you know, thankfully, um, you know, great uh, surgeon at Sick Kids, uh, uh, Dr. Humphrey, who uh, uh, a very uh, you know a talented uh, neurosurgeon, uh, put. Uh, you know, uh, t the tubes in my head to uh, which helps to uh, release the the pressure that is surrounding the brain. Um, so you know that those uh, you know shunts, as they call them, you know, saved my life. Um, but I also coming with spina bifida. Um, a lot of people they have uh, you know bladder and bowel issues. So um, you know they had to really watch those things as well. So like with the bladder, um, I can't. Uh, empty my bladder on its own. I need help with, uh, you know, a catheter that I, I would put in to, uh, you know, make sure the bladder is empty. And, um, but uh, with the, the bladder, like I've had bladder infections and I've also had, uh, you know, uh, kidney infections and things like that as well. Um, uh, I think when I was a, you know, young child, I um, went for a routine ultrasound and they discovered that I was uh, born with, uh, you know, just the one kidney. So, um, you know, they, they found that that was quite interesting to, and to go along with the bladder issues, um, 
that was something they really uh, needed to keep an eye on because they thought uh, maybe I might uh, end up having some kidney issues, things like that. So, um, you know, I went to sick kids for monitoring, and but I also went to uh, what was known at the time as the Key McMillan Center. And uh, so they also had a number of uh, doctors that, uh, you know, monitored my, my shunts and bladder, bowel. Um, also, like my orthopedic, like I had trouble walking. I used to use a walker and had um, the scoliosis surgery. I had a cur- I have a curve in my back, so they had to do uh, scoliosis surgery, um, you know, as a kid. But I would go there routinely every six months to a year for all these uh, checkups on things. And... Um, so they would test the bladder and the, uh, you know, bowel, all those sort of things. Um, but, uh, as I, you know, got into my, um, you know, teen years and, and into, uh, college, um, I, uh, you know, things were, you know, going well at first for college. And then I, uh, I got very sick. Um, you know, I was feeling, you know, lethargic and, um, uh, you know, just, you know, wasn't eating and, uh, you know, had vomiting and the whole bit and, um, you know, so I went to my doctor, um, you know, I, and, uh, he did a checkup and he said, Oh, Oh, you must have the flu. Um, but, uh, uh, he didn't uh, do any blood pressure check, no, you know, blood test to see what was going on. So I found that, uh, uh, kind of odd. Uh, so, you know, things, you know, I wasn't getting any better, um, you know, cause with the flu it usually would go away after a few days. So I wasn't getting any better. So I, um, I had an eye appointment uh, coming up, so I went for a routine eye exam, and, uh, you know, everything was fine, and, you know, the left eye, but the right eye, uh, you know, it was uh, blurry. I, no- I noticed uh, when I went through the examination, it was blurry, and um, so the doctor, you know, noticed that, and so he said, um, yeah, I've noticed that you got some blood in your eye. It's very serious. I think you need to go to the, the hospital right now, so I went to the hospital and they, they checked and they noticed that there's blood in my eye and they, but they said, uh, um, we'll refer you to an, another eye specialist, um, you know, on Monday. So, you know, just go home for the weekend, um, and, uh, you know, go see the eye specialist on Monday. So I went to see, uh, saw the eye specialist. And, uh, so he did a number of tests on different things. And, uh, so yeah, he noticed the blood, uh, the blood in my right eye as well. So he said, uh, have you had your blood check, uh, pressure checked recently? And I said, no. So he checked my blood pressure and, uh, it was extremely high, 220 over 130, like the, the most, uh, I think the highest, uh, it could ever be. So he said, you, you got to go to the hospital right now. You're, you're very sick right now. You could possibly have a heart attack or stroke. So, uh, you know, I went with my mom over to, uh, North York General and they did a whole bunch of tests, including a blood test and everything, like they thought I was going to have a stroke. So they, uh, called in a heart specialist to, you know, monitor things. And, uh, so they took the blood tests, um, you know, did, tried to, you know, calm me down, tried to bring down the blood pressure as much, uh, as they could. And, uh, so the blood test came, ba- came back and, uh, it wasn't good news at all. The, they, for the blood test, they checked for all different, uh, you know, things to see what was going on. But they also, because of the history of my uh, shunts, they thought, oh, maybe there's a, a problem with my shunts. So they did a CAT scan, just a whole bunch of tests. But the, the blood test gave the answer of what uh, happened. And um, for a normal functioning kidney, um, you know, they have to test your creatinine. Your creatinine level tells you how much, how well your kidney is doing. Uh, so uh, the blood test came back and my uh, creatinine was uh, 705 and the normal level is between... 55 and 110 for male, somewhere around there. So my creatinine was way over what it should be. So they, they said, yeah, you're going into kidney failure. We got to call in the, um, the kidney specialist, a nephrologist. So, um, and this was one I've seen before because there's some issues with my kidney, but it, you know, just got to this point where they had to call in the nephrologist and they, uh, you know, kept me in the hospital for 10 or 11 days. My uh, potassium level is very high, and when your potassium level gets too high, it can uh, cause uh, your heart to stop. So they gave me medication to try and bring the potassium down and did whatever they can to try and, you know, uh, restore my kidney back to where it was. But um, they were able to improve it somewhat, but uh, it was too late. And they said, um, you know, I'm sorry, you're going to need, you know, kidney dialysis. So they referred me to the... uh, kidney dialysis uh, team at, um, 
York Central Hospital, as it was known uh, back then. It's now Mackenzie Health. And saw uh, Dr. Naku, who is uh, my uh, kidney doctor uh, today. And so he said, yeah, you need to, to go on dialysis. And it was pretty emotional. Like, I, I couldn't believe that. Yeah, this is it. My kidney's failing. I need dialysis. And, you know, I know my mom was upset on that. So it was, uh, you know, uh, quite the quite the turn of events there. Wow, what a story. Yeah. So you started doing dialysis, and yeah. what happened after that? Were you instantly put on a, the donor list, or how did it go? Um, yeah, so what they had to do to prepare me for dialysis, like uh, um, Dr. Matthew at the time, he said, you know, you do have some time to before you need dialysis, but it's pr- very close, so uh, they had to do a procedure which is called a fistula, where they, um, you know, connect an artery and a vein together because the um, the dialysis needles are are larger than what you, you what uh, you would get for a, a regular blood test. So they um, they did a procedure called the fistula, and um, you know this one worked very well. Like I'll, I'll t- tell you later on about the issues I've had with the fistula as, uh, as of late, but this one you know wor- worked uh, very well. But uh, it needed time to develop before the needles could go in. So. Uh, I had that in December of uh, 97, and then I was put on dialysis uh, March of uh, 98. So I think um, at that time, I was uh, put on the uh, donor list. Um, and they said at the time that the, the wait would probably be about uh, five years. So dialysis, I you know went to the hospital uh, three times a week. I was uh, initially put uh, on the machine for three and a half hours um, uh, you know, per day, but uh, as my condition got, got like I, um, you know, noticed some, um, I was short of breath. I I went to uh, the park with, uh, you know, my family and just walking around, I couldn't notice I was short of breath. So I told the doctor that. So they said, yeah, we got to increase uh, your dialysis. We noticed some fluid around your heart. So uh, they increased my time to four hours, uh, three times a week. I usually, um, like I was going to college still at the time. So, uh, I would go in the evenings, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for four hours at uh, York Central. So I, I did that for about a year and a half. And, uh, you know, when you go to the dialysis, sure, it's not, you know, not pleasant. You have to arrange your transportation. I used the um, Marco Mobility Service to bring me there. So my mom didn't have to, you know, drive me there. So she didn't have to worry about that. So, you know, they were, they were very uh, good about that. And, uh I remember the first time I was on dialysis, I was just so nervous. My blood pressure was very high, but uh, the nurses were great. They, um, you know, helped to, you know, calm me down and, and to to see the other patients there, you know, going through, you know, the same thing like that, um, you know, it was good to have them there for support. And, uh, you know, you, you become, you know, part of a family being there, you know, you're there so often that you really get to know the, the nurses and the patients quite well. And, uh you know, to pass the time, you know, back then we had the uh, VCR, uh, VCR tapes. I'm sure the kids today have no idea what that is, but, uh, so I had, uh, I would bring in, you know, some movies to, uh, all pass the time. And so we all watched movies together and, and laughed and, you know, had fun with the nurses and that sort of thing. And, but that was great. But, you know, just the, the realization that I, I had to do this, like in order to stay alive, I had to go to the hospital three times a week. And so it, uh, you know, it played a toll and, you know, to do that for a year and a half was, uh, you know, quite a long time. Wow. Well, um, I've got another statistic here, which isn't a a lovely one, but um, it says that 4,300 Canadians are waiting on the kidney donation list. They're waiting for a kidney donor. 4,300 people. That's a lot of people. That is a lot. Currently in Canada, according to the Canadian um, Kidney Foundation, 4 million Canadians suffer from kidney disease. Wow. Wow. That's a staggering statistic. Right. It is very staggering. Wow. So, Jason, it's one thing to just keep talking over and over again about kidney disease and the number of people who suffer from kidney disease. What does suffering from kidney disease look like? Do you have a backache, a stomach ache, a headache? What What does it feel like to have kidney disease? Um, yeah, you, you could possibly have a stomach ache. You could possibly have, uh, you know, pains in your back. And, 
you you get uh, you know short of breath, have trouble sleeping. Uh, there's some nights now um, that I have uh, restless legs, uh, um, itchiness. Um, you uh, yeah, you can get uh, you know nauseous. Like uh, before I was on dialysis, yeah, I was getting nauseous when uh, you know the kidney disease was pro- pro- progressing. I yeah, I wasn't eating as well. Um, you know, lethargic, I would have a kind of a metallic uh, uh, taste in your mouth, but I was also um, like I wasn't able to go uh, pee uh, that much. Like uh, fluid was building up in the body, so your your body's not able to, you know, remove the excess uh, fluid and, and the toxins. So uh, um, I'd really had to be careful what I was eating, uh, especially, as I mentioned, about the potassium uh, going very high because that can cause... Uh, heart issues and uh, when phosphorus goes high that can uh, cause uh, issues with your bones and your teeth and things like that so it was a matter of um, um, you know trying to you know watch my diet watch the the things that I consume uh, you know looking at uh, food labels and things like that and you know consulting with the dietitian and and also fluid intake I had to really make sure that I wasn't uh, you know drinking a much uh, too much fluid as uh, you know over time it can you know build up in the body and uh, so that's where you know the dialysis machine you know helps to to remove the excess toxins and uh, the fluid from the body uh, and also to ma- manage the, uh, the the pH balance because when your your uh, kidney is in disease it's more um, uh, acidic so uh, the machine uh, helps to bring it to more of an uh, alkaline uh, uh, level that way so it's a matter of uh you know uh, looking at the different uh, chemistry of the the blood and and things like that and try to uh, uh bring it back to a, a a normal balance so but you know being you know i was doing dialysis and doing it now three times a week uh like uh you know speaking to you now i have to be very careful the next uh, couple of days knowing that i'm you know not going to be on the, the machine till till monday that i have to be careful of, uh, you know, the things I eat and the things I, I drink and to monitor for, for different, uh, you know, symptoms like that. And there's some nights where, um, you know, I'm having trouble sleeping and, and uh, you know, so your energy level goes down as well. So dialysis actually acts like the kidneys in that it removes waste and excess fluid from your blood. Right, right. What happens? Like the you have the fistula. And yeah. the machine is hooked up to your fistula, and it just rinses your blood out, so to speak. Um, it does, yeah. So, yeah, as I was saying, um, uh, um, it all depends on the person. Like some people, they only need three hours of dialysis or three and a half. But uh, you know, for me, they determine that uh, four hours of dialysis is enough to uh, to bring the um, the the, uh, the body back into uh, a normal uh, balance. So. Uh, so yes, it cycles the the uh, the toxic blood through the machine. It goes through uh, this um, artificial kidney known as a dialyzer. So it dial um, go it removes the, uh, the the fluid and the toxins and returns the the clean blood back into the body. So it's just a continuous cycle for uh, for about uh, you know four hours. And uh, you know during dialysis, they you know monitor your blood pressure. Like well, they take your temperature at the beginning and then they take your temperature at the end because uh, the um, you know if things aren't going well, the, the possibly your temperature could go up and your blood pressure could either go too high or too low. So it's a matter of uh, you know monitoring those things and and when they remove uh, too much fluid, you you can get cramps in your feet and you know possibly a headache and things like that. So uh, so they have to monitor things uh, you know very closely and uh, you know but after after treatment you're you're feeling better. I mean you're um, you know, a lot of times uh, you you feel tired after treatment, and then uh, you know, n- normally the next day I feel better, more energized, and stuff like that. But uh, you know, when you you initially go on dialysis, you you know you're very sick. Uh, um, you know, but uh, you know, once you get on a regular schedule, you don't you your uh, uh, your appetite comes back. You're not t- feeling you know nauseous and lethargic and things like that, and you have more energy and. Uh, they also, during the treatment, they also give you uh, a medication to uh, increase your red blood cells because when your red blood, blood cells are too low, that can cause your energy to go down. So um, that's another key thing. So the kidney, it regulates your blood pressure, it regulates your 
um, red blood cell, your hemoglobin count. So they give you a medication during dialysis called EPREX. And uh, so I get that uh, pretty much every treatment and that helps to, you know, maintain your energy and things like that. And, uh, but yeah, once you get on dialysis regularly, you, you feel a lot, a lot, uh, a lot better. All right. Well, We're going to take a break, but when we get back, we'll continue talking about your story. One thing that we'd like to stress to the listeners is that um, with so many people suffering from kidney disease, it's really important that people understand what it is and that it is not an easy road. It is a difficult road. It's... um, there's a lot involved, and it's it's not as easy as getting plugged into a machine, rinsed and recycled, and then you're back on your feet again. It's a long, arduous process, and you can live a very fulfilled life while you're on dialysis, but it's so much better to not be on dialysis. So we want to stress, and with this show, just bring a little bit of awareness to people of what um, kidney disease is and that you can go online and, and search up all kinds of ways that you can donate to the Canadian Kidney Foundation or the Ontario Kidney Foundation or the Kidney Car and all the rest of the wonderful fundraisers that they do to help people who are on dialysis. You're listening to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. This morning we're talking about kidney disease and we're talking with the one and only Jason Rumble. We'll be right back, so stay tuned. Hi, this is Bren Masson, host of Fresh Waves. If you're enjoying this show and you'd like to invite other people to listen to the broadcast, you can always go to our YouTube channel at Fresh Waves Radio. Make sure you hit subscribe and then you'll have access to all the great Fresh Waves podcasts. We love to have subscribers. We also love to hear your stories and comments. So if you have a story you'd like to share on Fresh Waves, just flip me an email, Bren at freshwaves.ca and we can have a chat and get you on the air. We're going to get back to the show right now, so stay tuned to Fresh Waves. Hi, we're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and this morning we're speaking with Jason Rumble. Jason Rumble is the technical producer of Fresh Waves. He's been with the show for over 10 years, and he is a kidney recipient. He he received a kidney from his sister, and we'll talk about that in a second. And he has suffered from kidney disease um, and recently is back on dialysis. So this morning we're going to, in honor of Kidney Awareness Month, which is the month of March, we're going to talk about kidney disease. So let's get on with your story, Jay. Thanks for joining us this morning, and thank you for sharing your experiences with the listeners. I know sometimes it's not an easy thing to do, but I think it's a really worthwhile thing to do. It sure is definitely, uh, you know, awareness is key. And, uh, you know, lately on Facebook, I've been, you know, putting stuff out about, you know, what I'm going through and, and, uh, you know, I want to help others uh, to identify kidney disease. Like, yeah, for me, I had no idea that I had kidney disease. So that's, you know, that's very scary because, yeah, a lot of doctors think, oh, that's just the flu and, you know, don't worry about it. So you really have to, you know, know when it's time to see a kidney specialist about your, your issues. So knowing what the symptoms are and, uh, you know, um, to, to ask your family doctor to refer you to a nephrologist and, uh, you know, see what they can do to, uh, you know, help, you know, maybe avoid dialysis. Maybe it is possible to, uh, you know, get you on a, you know, a, a regular diet and things like that, uh, that can uh, delay dialysis or, uh, you know, um, you know, try to, you know, keep things, uh, you know, uh, as, as good as they can be. But for yeah, some patients, yeah, they, you know, it progresses to the point where they need dialysis and possibly a, a kidney transplant if they choose to do that. All right. So it's partly, um, it's nice to become aware of what the symptoms are, but um, many people are aware because kidney disease happens to be hereditary. And so in instances where you have a family history, I'm sure there are people are keeping track of you all along. Did you have a family history of kidney disease? As far as I know, I don't think so. But um, um, yeah, but that maybe going back through the generations or different family members, uh, it's possible. Um, I know one aunt um, on my uh, dad's side, she was born with one kidney, but she never had any kidney issues. She lived to be in her 90s, and she was just fine. So some people, yeah, they have, um, you know, just the one kidney. Like normally most people are born with two, but uh, on rare occasions, like for my aunt and I and some others, that you can have one kidney, and some people, they never have issues. They can go through their whole life and be just fine. But 
I'm sure there must be, you know, going back through history, there must be some, uh, you know, family member that had uh, kidney issues as well. But as far as I know, I'm, I'm the only one with the, the spina bifida issues. So that's a that's a very good question. Mm-hmm. Well, we have had guests in the past, and you've been on with them who have had enormous family histories of of kidney disease. Well, hopefully one day this will no longer be an issue and we can find a cure for kidney disease and a lot of other diseases that plague us on this earth. So let's get back to your story. You you went to the doctor, you weren't feeling well, he thought you had the flu. It turns out that you, you had a kidney that was failing and then you went on dialysis. And now you're on dialysis for how long? Um, So back then uh, I was on dialysis for about a year and a half, going to the hospital, um, you know, three times a week, four hours, uh, you know, per treatment. And uh, yeah, it uh, it definitely took a toll uh, because, yeah, just having the, you know, arranging the transportation and, and, uh, you know, the preparation to get on the machine. And then um, after the machine, um, you know, we had to make sure that, you know, the bleeding, you know, stopped uh, on, uh, you know, after your treatment uh, with the fistula, you had to, so that took about 10 to 15 minutes. So just doing that uh, all the time, yeah, definitely took a toll. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, so uh, it was on my 23rd birthday, uh, you know, um, for celebrating, uh, you know, uh, and uh, my sister and I, we went to the kitchen to have a talk. And uh, she surprised me with the, the, the greatest news I've ever had, uh, you know, given to me that uh, she was going to save my life with a, with a kidney. And, I, and you know, I had no idea she was going to do this. She, you know, kept, uh, you know, kept this from me. And, and she, you know, at the time, she wasn't too sure if she wanted to go through this. She had a, a young child at the time. And, you know, there's so many, you know, factors to, you know, think about. And she... Uh, you know, I think it really, you know, bothered her that uh, knowing her brother had to go through this, going to the hospital three times a week, and it really had an effect. And and uh, she became aware that, uh, you know, she she could do something about this. She could uh, go through, you know, the testing and and do the uh, the transplant to remove you from dialysis. And and they say that your sibling is uh, probably your best match for for a donor. Um, and she happened to be a perfect match for, you know, same blood type, obviously, and everything seemed to match up quite well. And uh, so we, um, you know, it was quite emotional, uh, you know, that Christmas, my, my birthday is in November. Uh, Christmas was quite emotional, knowing that the, the transplant was going to be happening uh, next month, uh, January 18th of uh, 2000, and everything you know, went quite well. Uh, actually, my kidney was working well, uh, better than my sister's. They're kind of joking about that. That uh, you know, the transplant, uh, you know, just worked. worked uh, the kidney started working right away. Um, you know, for some people, you know, uh, it takes a while for the kidney to wake up and get going. So they might need dialysis at the initial point. But for me, um, everything seemed to go quite well. Uh, you know, the creatinine came down to you know normal levels, and you know, the blood tests were you know, just perfect at the time. And, uh, you know, it was uh, amazing how I went from being sick, you know, being on dialysis to feeling a lot better. Like I, you know, woke up from the surgery and I felt like I could run a marathon. I was just feeling so good, my energy and, and everything like that. So uh, I was in the hospital for about seven days and my sister was there for about uh, five days. And, uh, you know, I've been so used to, you know, operations going to sick kids many times and, my sister, you know, being fairly healthy, she, uh, you know, it took a toll on her. Like she, uh, um, you know, she's going through hallucinations from the, the pain medication and things like that. And so it's more of a, you know, rougher time for her. But, uh, you know, eventually she was okay. And she went to, to be home um, after five days at the hospital. And, and for her, you know, back then, um, they, uh, they didn't have the laparoscopic, uh, it was not uh, common back then to do that kind of procedure to, uh, take out the, uh, her transplanted kidney. So they had to do a bigger incision. So, you know, with that it requires more of a recovery time. So she was probably off work for maybe six to eight weeks, that sort of thing, but she was able to, you know, get back to work and, uh, you know, do well. And I was able to, um, you know, get back to doing uh, volunteering. And uh, I actually uh, uh, found a job through the March of Dimes. Uh, they help uh, 
people with uh, disabilities uh, find work. So they were able to help me find a you know full time job at um, you know at a a, a summer camp. Um, uh, so I really enjoyed doing that. And uh, but uh, you know things were going well. But then shortly, about six months after, there, I had some issues with the kidney. The, one of the arteries in the kidney was narrowing, so they, you know, they were worried about that because that could, uh, you know, shut down the kidney. And I also had uh, an infection at the time, so I had to go back to St. Mike's where the uh, the transplant uh, t- took place, and they were able to, uh, you know, take care of those issues, or, you know, restore things back to normal. And then I was able to, uh, you know, function normally for 19 and a half years uh, like doctors wow. originally, yeah, doctors originally, you know, they said, um, you know, your kidney's probably going to last only 10 years. So it lasted 19 and a half years. So I was quite amazed that that lasted longer than it did. And I think it's part uh, to, you know, having regular uh, clinic visits at St. Mike's and um, all the medications you have to take, um, uh, anti-rejection medications, um, that there's uh, three different ones I had to take. I had to take medication for blood pressure and and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, uh, so even um, when you get the donated kidney, you, your journey isn't over at that point. No, it just no, begins a, a kind of a different journey. Um, exactly. Okay. So for those living with kidney disease, and there's so many people that are currently on dialysis, the dream is to get a donated kidney. I have heard, or it is said that the live donor kidneys work better than the cadaver kidneys, but you'll take whatever you can get at this point. Um, so you, after your 19 years, the kidney started to fail and now, right. now you're back on dialysis. Back on di- dialysis a second time. Uh, oh. um, yeah. Like it was, it's hard to believe. Like I, I had a pretty good run and uh, you know, going back to see my, my kidney doctor that I saw years ago, Dr. Nathu and uh, um I think uh, yeah, he's surprised that uh, you know see me back there again. But I, you know, it's you know it was a lot better to have that was 19 years than to be back on dialysis right away. There's I've heard of stories where you know uh, people have their transplant and and within you know months or maybe a couple of years it fails and they're back on dialysis. So for me, I'm very fortunate to have those 19 and a half years where you know some uh, have issues right away and. So uh, yeah, to yeah to go back and dialysis again, uh, yeah, it, it took some you know getting used to it again. It's you know being such a long time ago, you know you kind of forget certain things. I mean, certain things you know come back. Uh, you know when you remember that you have to be careful what you eat and that sort of thing. So um, so they they knew that I was going to be needing dialysis soon. So the St. Mike's transplant team referred me to uh, the. Uh, Mackenzie Health uh, Kidney Care uh, Kidney uh, Care Clinic at uh, on um, you know Young Street there where I go for dialysis the Oak Ridge's uh, clinic so they were uh, trying to do all they can to you know delay uh, dialysis as much as they could and then I uh, you know s- summer of uh, 2019 I had um, some uh, health issues I had a number of things going on and so eventually my my kidney did uh, you know shut down so. Uh, so they had to put me on dialysis then, and uh, and then once I was, uh, you know, fe- I was in the hospital for two and a half weeks. They were trying to, you know, get my blood pressure under control and things like that. And uh, so, and so eventually, I went uh, to the Oak Ridge's uh, uh, dialysis clinic, and that's where I've been uh, ever since. Uh, last uh, coming up on three years this August. Wow, that's what a story, Jason. What a story. It sure is, yeah. I can't, I can't believe the things I've been through in, in the last three years. So tell us a little bit about what dialysis is like. I mean, um, like, tell us what it's like. You have to spend four hours every time you go, and that doesn't right. include getting there and getting home. So it takes, what, half an hour, 45 minutes to get there? Yeah, about a half an hour. Um, yeah, yep, go, so, so I go to the Oak Ridges Clinic and... Being in Stovall, yeah, it takes about 25 minutes, half an hour to to get there. And uh, uh, like at first, I was doing the the, the real trans service, and um, I started off at the uh, the evening shift, and you know I wouldn't get home till like 10, 10:30. 10 and sometimes they, they, you know, they would have to drop off somebody uh, else first, and then take me home. And I'm just so tired; I just want to get home. So I uh, 
um, the the, uh, the team at the McKenzie Hall, they've been great. I, I spoke with the uh, social worker and I said, I'm, you know, uh, you know, I'm not t- too happy with the world trans services or anything else you can recommend. And so she uh, arranged me uh, to get a taxi service and I've had a really nice driver the last couple of years. He, uh, it's either himself or his son. Sometimes his daughter comes to pick me up and they take me right home. So, you know, they, they pick me up on time, you know, take me right home. So I know that I'm, you know, the only you know, person in the car, the only person I have to, to worry about. So it's, yeah. It's nice to have that uh, that service as well. So Yeah, and that would be um, really important during the pandemic when, you know, riding buses wasn't always possible, nor was it the best option for someone like you who's a little more vulnerable than the rest. Exactly. So I was glad to have that taxi service to take me door to door and, uh, yeah. you know, keep me safe. And- yeah. So back to the dialysis, um, you get there. And basically now you've upped your time to five hours out of your day, not to mention getting ready and all the rest of it. And then you're tired when you get home. So it basically takes up your entire day and you get there and I've heard that it can be kind of uncomfortable when they hook you up. Um, It can be. I mean, um, like what I have now is I have uh, a catheter to my neck called the central uh, venous catheter because I've had, um, uh, you know, the last few years I've had issues with the, you know, fistulas and things like that. Like the the first uh, time I had, di- I had dialysis, uh, you know, years ago, uh, they were able to do a fistula in my right arm. Like I'm left-handed, so they said your, your right arm would probably make sense to do something there, and the fistula worked right away. So, um, you know, doing um, uh, getting ready for dialysis with the fistula this time was um, I saw a surgeon at uh, St. Mike's Hospital when she uh, – you know, I asked her, you know, can they, you know, you know, I've had success with the, the right arm before. Can they do something in there? And, and she, she was a little bit hesitant. She said, um, you know, there's a chance that you could lose your arm. Like if, uh, you know, the, the you know, the blood vessels didn't, uh, if the connection didn't add up right, you could have some real issues with your arm. So she's hesitant to do that. So she said, um, you know, let's uh, do something in your, in your left arm. And, um, I, the, the first one worked okay for like a few, <laughs> A few days, I mean, I think it was just a couple months or it wasn't very long. And that, that one clotted up, so they just do this procedure to see if they can open up the uh, the fistula to get uh, the blood uh, flowing again. But, uh, you know, that didn't work, and they've tried other procedures. And and so, um, you know, finally, just recently, I was at uh, Toronto General for, um, uh, for a graft. Like, for some people, a fistula is where they... Um, naturally uh, 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 connect your artery and vein together, but the graft is for maybe people that have tiny blood vessels and and they use an actual artificial uh, tube they put in your arm to connect the artery and the vein together. So I just had a procedure uh, done uh, about a week, or just over a week ago, and uh, so they said they can, um, I'm going to speak to the doctor uh, on Monday and see if they could start using uh this graft in my arm uh, next week, and if things go well with the graft, they can take the uh, the catheter out of my neck. Um, but the one thing I like about the catheter is that they don't have to put needles in my arm, so it's it's not uh, painful. You know, um, they there's a they there's just, a trade off, isn't there? <laughs> there, yeah. So they are able to you know flush the you know the line. Sometimes uh, you know one of the ports doesn't work, so they have to kind of use another port and. Uh, but there's more risk of infection. I've had, uh, like, I have this port on my left side, um, but I used to have it on the right side, and I had uh, a few infections there. But uh, so far, everything's worked well on the left side, but uh, there's always a, a greater risk of infection rather than going with a fistula. Like, a fistula is your, your primary choice for dialysis. Uh, a graft is second. Like, there's still a chance there could be some infection in the graft, but it's very, very uh, minimal. But um, the, 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 the catheter is... Uh, something they really have to um, uh, be careful of for infection. But there's, uh, depending on the person, the, the, the catheter is your only choice. Maybe your your blood vessels aren't uh, well enough to do a fistula, so your only choice is a catheter. But uh, the Toronto General um, Vascular uh, Surgeon, he was able to find a spot in my upper right arm, and things seem to be working well. Uh, so hopefully, um, you know, maybe Monday or maybe Wednesday, maybe in a few days, I'll be able to, Use a lot to see what the, the doctor says about that. 
So can you travel? I know um, March obviously has March break. People like to go traveling, even, you know, now that the pandemic is just over, they're traveling down to the U.S., they're traveling to the Caribbean. Can you travel when you're on dialysis? You can, but it takes a lot of planning. Like you can't, um, you know, spontaneously pack your bags and head off to wherever. Uh, but it takes more planning where, um, like years ago, the first time I was on dialysis, uh, uh, my mom and I went to visit my cousin down in Florida, and uh, so it's a matter of, you know, finding out uh, what uh, clinics are near where my cousin was staying or where my, where my cousin was living. Um, so it's a matter of, uh, you know, arranging the, the dialysis and, and also um, uh, OHIP. I'm not too sure if they do still have it now, but OHIP uh, covers uh, a certain percentage of your treatment. So the rest you'd have to, to pay for on your own. And there was also what I didn't realize at the time was a doctor's fee. Like I never saw a doctor when I was down there. So there's still a doctor monitoring your case. So you have to pay for the doctor's fee and stuff like that. So it takes a little bit wow. more planning. Like, like I know cruise ships have dialysis on there. And, and so you really, you know, whatever destination you're going to, you really have to check and see is there dialysis there. And, and so it's a matter of arranging through, you know, social worker and things like that, yeah. uh, you know. But I guess the bottom line is it's not an easy process. You're basically tied to this machine at your clinic forever in a day. You are. And, yeah, it's nice to be able to go down to Florida in the hot sun. And it's, uh, you know, when your kidney's, you know, functioning, you don't have to, you can just go down and enjoy your vacation. So it was, yeah, it was a pain that I had to take time out of my a vacation down there to do the dialysis, but uh, you know that's uh, that's what you got to do, vacation or not. I, I have to have this uh, be hooked up to this machine three times a week. So when you're hooked up for the four hours, what can you do? You're hooked up and you can't go anywhere, can you? No, you can't. I mean, um, uh, you know they have, they have TVs there now, so you can you know watch TV if you want, or um, I have a you know iPad I bring in to watch Netflix movies and things like that or listen to a podcast or listen to mu- uh, music so you can do that and you know sometimes I you, you get tired on the machine so a lot of patients will sleep for a little bit and watch TV or whatever so but yeah you, you really can't uh, you know do anything while you're there so you have to find things to you know help you pass the time and and it, and it does help pass the time I find like yeah there's some days that I keep looking at the clock thinking, oh, I got an hour to go. I got two hours to go. And, but then, uh, you know, once you, you know, getting into your show, whatever, it helps to pass the time for sure. Yeah. Now, um, I know during the pandemic things were different, but now that things are easing off, do you get to talk to the other patients that are in dialysis? Uh, you do. Like uh, right now, um, you know, as you're waiting uh, to be, you know, checked in, they, you know, check your weight and temperature and, and things like that. You can, you know, talk to the patients as you're, as you're waiting and you, you get to know their, their stories and, you know, what they're going through. And, um, you know, I've heard of a few patients that I, I knew had, that have passed away. Like some people, um, um, you know, dialysis is their only option or they've had other health issues that, uh, you know, where they, they, they pass away. So you, you know, really it hits you, you know, cause you're part of a family, you're being there three times a week, you're spending a lot of time and you get to know the nurses and that. So, uh, but yeah, no, it helps to, you know, speak to other patients to know what they're going through and to know that, uh, you know, we're all going through the same thing. Like some people have, you know, different experiences and, you know, some people need dialysis for the rest of their life, but then there's people like myself, um, you know, that are eligible for, um, you know, another transplant and, Mm -hmm. and yeah, so. So what uh, would you like to tell the listeners in summary? Because as usual, we've run out of time here. Um, What would you like to tell the listeners about kidney disease if you had to sum it up? um, uh, Kidney disease um, is something that uh, definitely does uh, affect your life. I think it's something that you really have to, to monitor your symptoms and, and, um, you know, if you're not feeling well, go to your doctor and, and ask them to, I think the key thing for me was uh, to, to get a blood test. Like, uh, make sure you, you know, you tell your doctor, um, you know, check my blood pressure, check my, uh, um, do some blood tests and things like that to, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, make sure they can confirm, you know, what you're going through and, and get the proper referral if you do a, a kidney specialist right away and, uh, 
to, to you know ask a lot of questions of the kidney doctor about your options. Uh, like right now, there's no cure for kidney disease, so there's either you know you go on dialysis or you can go uh, through a transplant if you want. So uh, it's a you know real um, you know it's a lot of you know discussion with your doctor about what uh, they feel is best for you. But it's I think it's very key to um, monitor your symptoms every day. Um, you know, let them know, you know, if you're, because, yeah, some people um, remain stable. Like, I'm, I've been doing pretty good lately, but some people, they, they their health uh, does uh, decrease. So it's uh, very important to speak to your doctor, let them know if you're not feeling well and, and see if they can adjust your medication. Maybe that'll help or increase yeah. your dialysis yeah. or what they can do. Yeah. Well, and then in the end, um, I guess we could summarize by saying that uh, there are all kinds of things that people can look into in terms of being a donor. You can be a live donor and there, are, you know, just Google it if you're interested in doing something like that and helping someone who has kidney disease. And of course, go to beadonor.ca and sign that donor card. And um, when you're no longer using your organs, perhaps someone else can. Thanks so much for talking to us today, Jay. We really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your experiences with dialysis. Um, I hope you continue to have your cheery, happy Jay kind of attitude. And uh, you have become my um Netflix guru, you let me know which movies you really enjoyed and which ones you didn't. So perhaps you should become a, a film critic in the near future and we'll have a fresh wave show just about the best films that Jason has watched at Dialysis. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a great idea. Like, uh, Yeah, I know I've gotten into so many shows and it's amazing, uh, you know, how much you can watch within a four hour t- time frame. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a great idea. Yeah, I should be a there we Netflix go. Uh, critic. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks again for joining us, Jay. And we hope that all of our listeners have a wonderful day. And again, if you'd like to hear more of the Fresh Waves broadcasts, please go and check out our YouTube page, Fresh Waves Radio. Hit subscribe and drop us a line if you'd like to be a guest on Fresh Waves. Bren at freshwaves.ca gets you right to where you need to be. Thanks again, Jay. Have a great day, everyone.